Okay, so um, before we get started today, I'd like to introduce you to our um, Hour of Code expert voice today, Maria Pareda, and she uh, works for Schoology, uh, a learning management system, and she said way back in July that she would speak with us uh, today, which was pretty awesome. So she is here, and um, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to share about design. Great. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to share my screen. I've never used Zoom before, so okay. give me one yep. second. Okay. And let me know if you see my presentation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great. So if we're ready, I'm going to talk a little bit about user experience design. So everybody um, likes to code these days. They say that coding is the future, but nobody, or nobody, not many people sit and think, what happens before you're ready to code? Um, how do somebody get from an idea to something that we want to materialize? And that's what uh, user experience design is. So I'm gonna do a quick crash course. Um, questions are welcome. Uh, it's better if we wait until the end, but if you have any pressing question, let me know. So I wanted to talk a little bit about design. There's this misconception that design is just colors and letters and things like that. But as technology becomes more pervasive, and we are so used to machines helping us with everything. There's the apps, there's Alexa that talks to you at home, there's all these things. And I think I just activated Alexa, so I apologize. Um, there's um, some experiences that leave you wanting more and some others that you're like, ugh, was that it? So these great men, Don Norman, coined this term of user experience design. And it was all about when you start using machines, it is the duty of the person that codes or design them to make them speak with humans and not the humans to adapt to the machines. Yeah. So before I get into user experience design, I wanted to do a quick uh, look at how design is part of our, our everyday lives and we somehow don't realize it. So I wanted to share some examples that affect us every single day and maybe it will give you um, a new eye for when you're looking for things, what's good, what's not. So there's this. Does anybody know what this is? And I don't know if you guys can are muted or not, but uh, this is an elevator switch. Oh, good one, elevator. Yeah. So which one, how do you go up? Is it the button on the left? Is it the one on the right? Is it the one on top? Is it the one on the bottom? So this is the perfect example of somebody that said, you know what, we need to have an up and down, we're gonna do it creatively. And nobody went and said, let me see if people understand this. I actually showed this to my children yesterday and they were quite entertained trying to figure out if you would go up with the top or the bottom. Yeah. Then we have this, oh, yeah. target door. <laughs> do I enter or do I not enter? I'm not quite sure because this door is telling me two things at the same time. So probably what I'll do is I'll go around and I'll find another door because I'm not quite sure what to do here. This one is a classic. <laughs> Who thought that it made sense to have the toilet paper right there? Somebody was told, hey, remember, we need a toilet paper holder. And they said, not a problem. And there it is. And in your moment that you need it most, you just cannot get it. Or think about this. Um, we're trying to make things accessible and probably a contractor or an architect said, hey, this building needs a ramp for people that have wheelchairs or mothers that have uh, little um, trolleys. So they said, well, let's put it. And at the end they're like, oh, we have a little bit that is left over, what should we do? and they put a step. So now the whole point of the ramp is moved. And this is my personal favorite. Uh, just the placement of a sign can change the meaning of something. And this one is, do you wanna have Jessica's family for dinner tonight? I bet they're very tasty. <laughs> so interacting with products 
should be like a conversation. And when people are designing or when we're designing Schoology, and we have to think about them as something that people are gonna use, uh, people are gonna wanna do things with, and they can get frustrated. So before we get into the nitty gritty of user experience design, I wanted to share this video. Let me know if you hear it. I think it might be because you have, maybe. You cannot hear it? Mm -mm. Mm. Let me see. That's, well, we'll have to forego the video. It was really funny though. It's somebody checking out from a grocery store and when they go to the cashier, the cashier says, username. The guy's like, I just want bread. He's like, wrong username, but I just want bread. Give me your postal code. And the guy says, oh, your username is blah, blah, blah. And it's like how sometimes when we interact with computers, how you feel the computer is talking to you. So sadly, we'll forgo the video, but I'll send it to you guys later. <laughs> but the whole point is that if you were talking to a person, you would probably think that they're a little unhinged and you would not want to continue the conversation. So why do we expect uh, differently from our everyday in real life than we do from computers? And that's where user experience design comes in. So how do we avoid creating terrible experiences? As designers, the first thing I have always to remember is that I am not the person who's going to use this. So we tend to think sometimes, oh, I would do it this way, or I like this color, or I like things like that. And we forget that we have nothing to do with the people that will be using it. So the first goal as a designer is to detach yourself from your personal likes and dislikes and get immersed into who will be using this product, this website, this application, whatever it is. So there's another video, but I'm gonna have to pass it. <laughs> But it just shows how there's not a lot of knowledge, like things that may seem obvious to us are not obvious to other people. And in this video, uh, some Google engineers were asking people, what is a browser? And people were saying, browser is Yahoo. Browser is where I put my search terms. And it's very eye-opening in understanding that some things that may seem very trivial to us, people out there don't know and as a designer we have to put ourselves in their shoes so how do we do that so before designing anything we like to visit the people that will be using this product and that's why last year we came to central york and we talked to a few of you and we talked to some students and we understood some of the issues that you had with Schoology. We really appreciated the candidness and to this day we still replay those recordings to some people so they understand what of the things, some of the things that we need to fix. But the best way to know who you're designing for is to go and talk to the person that's gonna be using this. Ask a lot of questions. My favorite question is always why, why, why? Because it just gets to a lot of things. Always understand the problems. Is I met a student um, last year that said that his biggest problem with uh, Schoology is that a lot of the things could not be done via mobile phone, but they, he only had a mobile phone. There was not a computer at home, and he had so many extracurricular activities that it was impossible for him to go and like sit in the computer lab at school for any um, long amount of time. So that was very telling, and that determined some of the changes we're doing this year, where we're going to start putting a lot of things, more things through the application. So we'll have some more parity of features. And the other thing we do is learn from numbers. We have a great tool that tell us when do people log in, where do they click, where do they go. If they clicked here and then they click there, um, is it because they're not understanding something? So for instance, if we see that a lot of people try to start a task and then they go to support, we know that that task probably has some difficulties. So that is a good way for us to start exploring. Uh, where we should start making some changes. So one thing that we need to keep in mind is that people like and need different things. Uh, this was designed by the niece of a designer 
It's Genevieve's mobile phone, and she designed her ideal mobile phone. And as you can see, it's great. It's a Barbie phone. Uh, it has a snail button, and when you push it, it turns into Barbie. It has a little Snow White store attached that has candy. Uh, it can convert into Dora, and it has a lot of magic buttons. So the bottom line of this is that not everybody wants a snail button that turns into Barbie. And just because Genevieve wanted these, it wasn't necessarily what she needed. So how do we avoid these? We make sure that we don't talk to one person, we don't talk to two people, but we talk to hundreds of people and we talk to people that are older and younger and people that consider themselves better at computers and worse at computers and people that only use things casually, things that use it every day, and we try to find an intersection. I wanted to show an example on how um, when HBO Now was designed, some things were not taken into consideration. So this is from a designer that loves Game of Thrones, but he got into Game of Thrones later in the game. So people had already seen four seasons and he was just starting. So uh, he talks about how every time he goes to HBO Now to watch it, he has to do this. He has to block the screen because it goes into the most recent season, the most recent episode. And he says there's pictures where people I thought were dead are coming back or where people I thought that would left the series are here. And it just gives me a lot of his spoilers. So he wrote a, an entire article on how if HBO now had really thought about how people watch TV, there's this um, culture of binge watching. Like I watch three seasons at once. There's people don't rush anymore at home because tonight they're showing something because we have it available on the internet at any time. So if they had done things differently, he would not have to spend his life avoiding spoilers of Game of Thrones for five entire seasons. If you, leave, if you look at Netflix or Amazon, which are designed differently and are designed with like digital uh, public in mind first, uh, you can see that it's slightly different. It always opens in season one. Um, there's not a picture that can spoil anything. And if you wanna see more, you really have to dig into it. So this is a good example of when people design, they need to do their homework and understand the concept. So I wanted to show something that you guys were familiar with. And I think you guys use Google, do you? And maybe you've seen some differences between what it was a year ago and what it is this year. So I'm gonna walk a little bit how that process was for us internally. So you know how we arrived to the product that we have today and hopefully uh, you like to use. So back in the day we said, our Google integration, it's not great. We were talking to teachers and the teachers were telling us how every time I have to give a Google assignment to my class, I have to give my URL, I have to teach them to change the end of the URL from edit to copy and that creates a copy. And there were a lot of creative ways um, that teachers were finding in order to share some Google documents. So we said, okay, we need to do something better. And we figure out that Google Documents were great because it allowed for the teacher to collaborate with the student and it allowed for many things. So the first thing we did was we created a new flow um, after talking to the teachers and to the students that makes sense. How would it be easy to submit a document? How would it be good, uh, easy to grade a document? From there, we created a very early uh, sketch or a very early drawing of what this Google integration would look like, and I'm sure it reminds you a little bit of something. But uh, we created these, and we started talking to teachers, and we asked them to use it. We asked them to start, oops. We asked them, do you see this is us? We are sharing the screen with a teacher, and they're going through this document and giving us their feedback. There were a lot of things that didn't make it at the end. But we did a lot of tests and we got a lot of great feedback from this test on how things should be used. So from there, we did another test and this is actually an old rubric that is no longer there, but we created a better prototype that looked like a real thing. And 
we um, put some hotspots where you could click around and do things, and we showed it to 400 teachers. So 400 teachers gave us feedback, and the feedback was like, this is covering the document, this is too small, I wish it was something different. And ultimately, we did another test where we didn't ask anything to teachers directly, we just put it somewhere and we asked people to click around. And as you can see, we started seeing where people were clicking and what they were doing if we asked them for a task. And when we felt confident that it made sense, that's when we built it. And these, if you're wondering what it is, is every time we build a screen, these are all the instructions we have to give to the engineers so they know how to build it properly. So we have to uh, put a little explanation for every single element of the page. So there's a lot of work that goes into these building design. So I know that we have limited time and I don't want to take too much. So the big takeaways are that when you are ready to build like the next app that is gonna make you a million dollars, you have to do your homework first. Before going and building anything, you need to understand who's going to use this. Where are they going to use this? Is this solving a real problem? Um, you always have to remember that not everybody thinks like you. If they think, thought like you, they would have that Barbie button. Um, always test. Test many, many times. And every time you make a change, test it again and test it again before you build it. Because you know what? It's much easier to test on a paper or on a quick drawing, then build the whole thing and then realize that it's not working. Um, one thing that is very hard is embrace failure. You're going to fail. Your first idea will never be the right one. Your second, it won't probably be the right one. But maybe the third is going to start being closer to what it is. And the most important thing is when you design something, think about the experience and all the context and not the features. So, in short, uh, what user experience is. Oh, that is priceless. That sums it up, that picture. <laughs> so, I have a question for everybody. Do you have a question? Does anybody have a question that they would like to share with Maria? Something that you would like to know? Or something that you wonder? Okay, it looks like Mr. Schweitzer has somebody. So I'll go on mute and let him unmute. Right over here, sitting in front of the camera. Oh, hello. Hi. Go ahead, Kiwani. Why do you want to work with Schoology? I want to work with Schoology because I think that education is very, very important. And I want to make sure that we make it much, much easier for you, the students, and for teachers to learn and to um, understand things in a better way. So that's why I went to Schoology. Okay. Mrs. Anton, does that child have a question? Child have a question? Yes. Um, make sure you speak loud and clear. Did you like designing Schoology? I mean, how long did it take you to design Schoology? So that's a very good question. So that's a very good question. Schoology was designed when I started working at Schoology, but maybe you've seen that we're making some changes where we're making things bigger and maybe we're making things a little more fun. Um, so all those changes have happened in the past year and you'll see many more coming. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. One more, one more. Um, what's, one more. What? Go ahead. Did you make Schoology because you like school? I, That's corny. That's uh, that is not corny. That's a very good question and I love it. Uh, we made Schoology because we want to make sure that your experience at school is as good as mine was. 
What's your favorite part about working for Schoology? I think talking to people like you. Every time I go to schools and I talk to students like you, that's my favorite part. Mrs. Antone, do you have another question? Okay. Um, oh, it, Mrs. Carlisle, is there a question on your end? Well, we just had uh, somebody was asking where Ms. Pareda is from, where Schoology is based. Oh, that's a very good question. So this is going to be complicated. I'm from Barcelona, Spain, wow. okay. but I moved to New York a few years ago and that's where Schoology is. So two months ago, I moved to Canada. So Schoology continues to be in New York, but now I live in Canada. So it's a global organization though, Schoology? Yes, one of the things that we're doing very well is that even though we're not all in the same place together, we work very well remotely with like Google Documents, we use Schoology, and we use a lot of video calls. Great, thank you. Okay. Oh, what got you interested in doing Schoology? What got you interested in doing Schoology? What got me interested in doing Schoology? So, um, I was working for a very boring company before. It was a bank. Banks are not fun. And somebody came and said, hey, we're looking for somebody that can help us with designing Schoology, would you like to come? And because I have two children, one is in first grade and one is in third grade, and I know how school is important to them, I said, yes, I want everybody to have the same opportunities. And I know we can do great things. And it looks like we have someone from the I team or a couple of kids from the I team. Do you want to unmute your mic or were you just there? They're teenagers. <laughs> I think they just wanted to take a look. You're up on the big, you can't, oh, yeah? there's, um, you're up on, they have you projected on a big screen and they're just kind of getting close to the microphone. I mean to the, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Bieber, did you have a question before we get ready? She's good too. So Maria, I was wondering, you know, we have been talking about programming with different um, people throughout the week. And we talked about like the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but you really brought to the forefront how important it is not only to get that programming language, to, but to make it look like it's inviting and people want to use it. Right. And I think that's so important. Um, and it's so hard to think of other people like the whole world whenever you're just used to what you like and what you want to do. So this That's was very really, true. very helpful. We I'm really glad. appreciate it. And it's okay if I share this with other classes and of course. public. Okay. 